And we're carrying on the project, the very big project that Guru Dev has given us, which is to read Bhagavad Gita as um, an introduction to Bhakti, to find Radharani hiding between the lines of Bhagavad Gita, and to show how in some ways Bhagavad Gita was doing the, the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, thousands of years before he made his appearance. And if, uh, in all humility, I think the project so far has been very fruitful. And we've been, we've managed to find the Radharani hiding in every corner of Bhagavad Gita, if I could put it that way, which has been very rewarding and very, very beautiful. There's, um, three, three, uh, small points that I want to remind you of before thinking of Bhagavad Gita. The one was um, that reading should be uh, an act of humility. That reading should be opening our hearts, being servants of the love in the text, and not being servants of the text. So making ourselves pipelines through which the divine spirit of the text can flow and not being masters of the text, not being professors. And the second idea is that um, reading should be bhajan. It should be a kind of practice in, in itself, uh, a way to make the love circulate and flow just like when we're doing japa, when we're doing samkirtan, when we're doing any kind of uh, bhajan. And then the third general idea I want to remind you of, I said last week, and it was, uh, I think, uh, an important realization, and that is that language is is material energy. Language has a danger of covering up the essential force, of covering up uh, the divine. And we can we tend to say things uh, that take us away from our goal and not toward our goal. So we need to remember that language isn't truth in itself. That we have to. Um, seek for the truth by reading, feel the truth, let the truth flow through us, but that the language, just reading aloud, is not truth. It's, it's the way we feel the language, feel the words as they flow through our voices and through our ears and, and through our hearts. We all know that language can lie. Language is not honest, always. So we have to make sure that the honesty comes from our hearts, and we don't pretend that it just comes from from language. It's, the sincerity must be from our own uh, sincerity and not from some sort of belief in the in the language. There are those small ideas I wanted to I wanted to remind us of as kind of background for for continuing to read. Last time we completed. Chapter 9, after 19 weeks, <laughs> we completed chapter 9, and we read the last three verses, 32, 33, and 34. In 32, you might remember we, we asked the question that we've asked before, <clears throat> does Krishna discriminate between jivas, among jivas? And the answer was yes and no. It was yes, in the sense that in the material world, there are certain systems, historical systems, and uh, and we're thinking most uh, immediately about uh, caste system and class system, but you can also think of race and, and other social divisions. But they're in place, and we we have to live in them and navigate through them in our material lives. But that in spiritual point of view, there's no discrimination. All jivas who seek sincerely God are seen with the same love uh, and uh, esteem by Krishna as all the others. 
So from a spiritual point of view, caste and class and, and race and these kinds of things are all external. They're not, they're not, they don't belong to the essential. And then there was a second brief point we had last week in verse 32 about shelter. I guess it was my point. It wasn't in the verse. It was something I wanted to repeat to you because we talk so much about shelter in this. I, I used to, I used to find this very confusing, what shelter means. And I asked last time whether it meant shelter from the storm or shelter from naughty people or shelter from uh, external ideas. And the idea that I, what I described for you was that shelter is meant as safety from the ignorance in our hearts. So to say that we take shelter of Gurudev, we take shelter of Radha Mohan, this is a way of putting in ourselves in a situation of support and protection from our own tendencies to be dishonest in our hearts, to be insincere or to be uh, impure, that we let things come into our heart that, that disturb the purification of, of the love in our hearts, the love we feel. And this is what we're seeking shelter from. The other shelters from rain and from criminals and and all the other uh, dark things in, uh, out there are all external shelters. This, this is not really what matters for us. It's the internal shelter that we're seeking. <clears throat> Verse 93 was also a message we've had many times about how fortunate we are. If I wanted to condense the most important part of the verse, it was about how unlikely our spiritual process is, how lucky we are to have come so far, in part just to have found rebirth as human beings who have souls that are so evolved and are so close to, to coming to the goal of full realization on the first. And then the second is that Reading Bhagavad Gita, associating together, taking the shelter of a guru. These are all terribly, terribly auspicious uh, advantages that we have. And that we're so very fortunate to be in this place, which is also a bit of a, a, a motivation for us to take the next step, to con continue the, this, the difficult task of moving forward in spiritual evolution. Uh, Prabhupada made an interesting um, reminder in that regard. He made the distinction between, about the material world, he made the distinction between false and temporary. In the Christian or Abrahamic uh, perspective, the world is false. This world we live here is untrue, false, inauthentic, and we are seeking to go to another place which is true. This is not our conception. For us, this world is true. It was created by, by, by God, but it is to be seen as temporary. Rabbi, I, can I just have a question to that? Mm. You were just repeating that this is the Abrahamic uh, conception. Yeah. But it could be that we are still influenced by it subconsciously. Yeah, oh, yes, yes. This is just the, this is just the challenge that Prabhupada mm -hmm. is referring to. That's why he made the point. So, what do you mean, Abra? That the world is false, and we need to go to the true things, mm -hmm. to that. So, in uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Old Testament Christianity, and in um, Islam. Brahma said that Judaism means the world is false. It's words of Shankaracharya. Like water for Dada, sorry, we have little trouble hearing. If you don't mind, sorry. What not accepted by Vaishnavas? In the school of Shankaracharya, they have like motto Brahma Satya Jagat Mitya. Brahma means um, reality, uh, absolute. It's not reality, it's absolute truth, is real. And the world. Where what we see is Jagat world. Mitya means false, not real. It, this statement by now is not accepted. It's a long time story of discussion between uh, Vaishnavas and force of Shankaracharya, but, but about this hmm. statement. Right. Very good. For those of you who don't, aren't familiar with this, so Sankhya philosophy is a, is a branch of Hinduism which, which 
just like Bayer said, is is based on dualism between true and false, and, and here and there it's very much like this <clears throat> Old Testament Christian view. And as Bayer said, then Vaishnavas are not accepting this point of view for the reason that Prabhupada gave us. Then the last little introductory point um, that I want to make was to remind you of verse 34, the last verse of chapter 9, this great verse about devotion. And it's the most famous in Bhagavad Gita, and it's repeated again in chapter 18. It's this, um, let's see, oh yeah, man mana bhava mad bhakto. Engage your mind always in thinking of me. And then I used the occasion last time to, so this is the one thing we have to do. If nothing else, in all our practice, engage our mind in thinking of God and, uh, and we'll make progress. So the most simplest form of bhakti is that. And why is it bhakti? Well, this is the part that I wanted to comment last time. Um, uh, it's about absorption or engaging your minds. I think Prabhupada uses the word absorption, being completely inserted into the activity. Absorption in realizing that we are, are part of God. It's a, it's a verse about what spiritual life is in very general ways. Engaging ourselves means doing more than just uh, registering on the on the membership uh, list of uh, bhakti. It means giving part of ourselves, giving part of our hearts. Engaging means giving part of our spirit, doing it in a way that it matters to us. It makes a difference for us. It's not just, like I say, paying your money at the cinema and then going inside, then you're engaged. No, it's about putting part of your heart into it. So this is the basic idea about devotion. We're not dry and mechanically involved. We're not formally involved. We're involved with our spirits, with our hearts, with our emotions. So every devotional service uh, is engaged in this way. Devo uh, engagement means this devotional service. And wherever there's devotional service, we've said it many times now, there is the presence of Radharani. There's the love of Radharani. Because it's the love for what we're doing. Even if it's only a tiny, tiny particle of love, this is what engagement means. This is what engagement is. So the more we invest our hearts in this practice of ours, in all the parts of it, or in any of the parts of it, in singing, in chanting, in associating, when it matters to us, when we put a little bit of our care in it, then we're doing, then we're on the, on the bhakti path, then we're engaging our minds in always thinking of God. So this idea of engagement is what sets bhakti apart. And all this chapter 9 then has been about what it means to engage what it means to invest our hearts in our practice, in every moment of our lives, in every part of our lives. Anything we care about, any little task all day long that we care about, when we put our heart into it, when it gives us pleasure or happiness, this is engaging in the work of God, even if it's only in the tiny, tiny way. So we move to chapter 10. Chapter 10 is called... Vibhuti yoga. And vibhuti means <clears throat> greatness, opulence, or sometimes it means wealth, richness. And yoga, of course, means union. We had yoga in the title of the last chapter. So vibhuti yoga means union with God through understanding of his opulence, through understanding of his greatness, through understanding of his, his wealth. Like we said, chapter 9 was about devotion. It was also yoga. It was Raja Guya yoga. Raja, you know, means king. And Guya, we learn, means secret or confidential. So it's, uh, it was uh, translated by Prabhupada as the most confidential knowledge. The most confidential knowledge. But if we want to be a bit more direct and literal with the translation, we would say something like union with God through the most secret things. And then we discussed in chapter 9 what the secret was. And the secret was, is fortunately not a secret for any of you, 
because you know that it's loving devotion. So the idea of yoga, yoga, union, all through Bhagavad Gita does not mean a mechanical connection like two train cars clacking together and hooking exterior and mechanical and cold and hard. When we talk about yoga, when we talk about union in bhakti, we're talking about a linking of hearts, a, a linking of feeling, a linking of emotion. This is what the most confidential secret was in chapter nine. We found out that union with God is devotional union. It's a union of hearts. It's a union of loving beings. It's not the two train cars clacking together and being hooked up. That's also yoga in a certain sense of the word, but it's not our way. So the only way we can live out this secret that we're so privileged to have is to be loving towards one another, one, one another. This is the secret of bhakti. This is the secret of bhakti. It's a relation to God, relation to each other, just as important as relation to God, which is one of loving, not mechanical, not uh, formal, not just regulative, but through loving relation. And then the path we're on, the path of the hidden path of devotion, to take that famous title, is one of deepening that love, deepening the love to God, but also deepening the love to each other, to those in our lives. What does deepening love mean, we found out? It means cleaning out all the things in our lives, in our hearts, and in our minds that distract us from the love. Our path is one of purifying love, and that means cleaning with, a, with all the tools we need, cleaning our hearts and minds from everything that distracts us from heaven. <laughs> so that the goal is, the, the goal is to be completely focused in loving devotion. That's the goal of the practice of Bhagavad So when now we're in chapter 10, then we're going to, we're going to further develop our union, our yoke with God, but through insight into his opulence, his vibhuti. But I hope you're going to, you know what I'm going to say now about vibhuti and opulence, opulence. I hope you know you've been listening to me for 19 weeks now. What I'm going to say is that it's not a union with God from the outside, looking at the wonderful facade of his opulence. We all know that Krishna is the most beautiful. We all know that Krishna is the most rich and the most powerful. All of these things are very, very interesting. But we don't stand at a distance and admire the opulence. We, we admire these things from inside, from within a real loving relation with God. So the yoke we're talking about, always in bhakti, is never external uh, linking together, never mechanical, but always inside. So we want to, so the title of this chapter, uh, Vibhuti Yoke, means establishing an internal relation with God, a loving devotional relation with the internal opulence of God. So not the exterior opulence of God, but internal. Mm -hmm. oh, no, the other one. Then. Yeah. Tiny. <clears throat> Once it's happened in Vraja, uh, one uh, poor Brahmana came to Krishna and told, please help me. I'm poor Brahmana. I have a daughter, which I must organize, arrange uh, marriage. But without money, without wealth, I couldn't do. Please help me. You are... Please help. This mantra, mean, mantra means you are um, protecting the cows and brahmanas. Please, I'm brahmana, please help me. And Krishna answered, but I'm just a coward boy. Why are you coming to me? I have not nothing. My father has, but I have not. And then he started to think because this person addressed him, not his father, and started thinking, what is my wealth? And he understood, I don't want to give my will. But he addressed, and I decided to give something. Okay. And he thought, okay, take my radha. <laughs> because it's only my wealth. And what's after happened, uh, they put radha on one 
how to say it? scale scale and uh, uh, on the other uh, place of the scale or what's to one to as gold <laughs> they try to measure how big is rather how big wealth is <laughs> but they could not they put in putting putting this gold but not rocking <laughs> until I, I remember uh, they put uh, leaves of Tulsi something like this only after this and Bram received Radha and he told oh what's happened I had one daughter. Now I have two daughters. We can get two, twice the more wealth. <laughs> it's about what does mean wealth for Krishna. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. So verse 1, this wonderful chapter 10. Bhuya eva mahabhau shinu ma paramam vachaha yateham priyamanaya vaksyam hita kabayaya my dear friend, beautiful already, my dear friend, mighty armed Arjuna, listen again to my supreme word, which I shall impart to you for your benefit, and which will give you great joy. So we only need to begin with the first words, my dear friend, Priyamanaya. You, you recognize the word Priya, which is what we ordinarily call Radha, the dear one. So, dear friends, Krishna says to Arjuna. And this is the key to everything about the Bhagavad Gita, isn't it? It's the dearness of this relationship. The reason, the reason that Arjuna is reaching understanding of the nature of the world and of Krishna, the reason he's advancing towards enlightenment, and the reason he starts from very little and goes to a fully realized state by the end of, of the book is because, because the dearness of the friendship with God is increasing throughout. From chapter to chapter, they become dearer and dearer. Again, compare this to the Abrahamic religions where God is an angry, uh, angry bearded man standing on a cloud shouting down instructions. Here it's a, it's a friendship. It's a loving relationship and it's a two way relationship. Let's be clear. Arjuna is a friend of Krishna and Krishna is a friend of, of Arjuna. And through it's, the, it's through the supreme word that Arjuna will become more familiar on a friendly basis, on a loving basis with the opulence of Krishna. So this, this internal beauty of Krishna is what will become more clear for uh, Arjuna because they're friends, because they love each other. And this is the model for our relationship again, a model for our relationship to Radha Mohan, to Guru, to our husband, to our wife, to our children. The more we can develop the dear, dear relationship to the person, the more we will experience the divine in the person and the divine beyond the person. There's another interesting word in the, in the Sanskrit part of the verse, this, uh, kamyaya, for your benefit. So kama, you, you remember this word too from kama yoga or kama gayatri, gayatri, the desire. It's the word for desire. And so we're talking about the desire of Krishna to tell and to increase the pleasure of Arjuna. Once again, this is not something you would find in, in, uh, in the Abrahamic religions at all. This, this idea that God should be desiring something from us and would be giving desire to us. So Krishna desires the well-being of Arjuna, desires to increase it out of love and greed. Uh, and uh, also he does it uh, because he wants to, because he, um, wants to feel that uh, that satisfaction as well. So who is behind this desire, this growing energy of of of, of attraction, of 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 greed? It's the energy of Radharani. The more our longing grows, the more our love grows, the more we take on the energy of Radharani, the goddess of love. And the more we come to union with God. <coughs> So the, it's a beautiful, friendly, friendly, loving gesture on the part of Krishna towards Arjuna. 
He wants Arjuna to come closer, wants him to feel pleasure, wants him to increase love, wants him to, to experience the energy of Radharani. What does Prabhupada say about this? Then let's look at the commentary. He says the following. The word paramam is explained by Parashara Minni, who's a Hindu astrologist uh, and a devotee of Lord Shiva. Prabhupada says, one who is full in six opulences, who has full strength, full fame, wealth, knowledge, beauty, and renunciation is Paramam, or the supreme personality of Godhead. It is, I forgot to spotlight everybody here. And the lovely Suniti. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, I learned many years ago this definition of Bhagavan, Aishwarasya Samagrasya, this uh, full uh, six opulence, who has in complete form all the six opulence, that person is highest, supreme person, he will go to Bhagavan. But I just started to think, what does it mean? Full strange, full name, from perspective of you. What do you know about Krishna, who is Radha? She is full strange, full fame, yes, Krishna's yes. wealth, knowledge, beauty, initiation. <laughs> I just understand mm. this, this uh, how to say, definition of Bhagavan. I heard from one Rasika Vaishnav, he told, from many definitions of Bhagavan, this is most not Rasika. But now I see it's Rasika also. <laughs> Radhe. Let's do this mostly. Mm. This is the discovery that Ar- uh, Arjuna is, is making as well. It's not explicit. It's not direct. It's also secretive. Why can Arjuna explain this, understand this? Why can you understand it? It's because of the loving relation you have. Mm. It's through the, your heart that you see this. It's through Arjuna's heart that he understands these six opulences, if you like. So this paramam, this, this great highest word, is a secret one. Once again, like we had before in chapter 9, it's the secret confidential knowledge which is available to us if we listen with our hearts and not with our brains. So it's not so very confidential because, of course, we all have hearts and big hearts in, according to the case. But this confidential knowledge is only for devotees. Once we become a devotee by opening our hearts, by feeling what we're hearing and not just hear it with our intelligence, our logic, our philosophy, then we can see it. Then we can understand it. So it's a key. Love is the key. Love is the code book to the universe. Once we understand the Da Vinci code, which is love, then we have access to all the riches of Krishna. Just look at it through our hearts. Everything we hear in our ears through the heart, not directly to the brain. Put it through the code book, through the rose-colored glasses, as we say in Europe. The loving glasses that turn everything into something loving and beautiful. It has to be this way. It has to be this way. If love were logical, if love were a fact, it wouldn't be love. If the secret of Krishna could be found in a dictionary, it wouldn't be Krishna. It wouldn't be true. Love is a mystery or love is nothing. It has to be that way. That's why there are secrets. That's why there are, that's why there are innuendos. That's why there are mysteries. Because love cannot be direct. It has to come through the sidelong glance. It has to come through the caress of one hand against another. It has to come through the prasadam we make for the loved one. It has to come through our cleaning on behalf of the other one. That's the way love comes, not like a flashing neon sign in Las Vegas. <laughs> That's just impossible. So we have to be grateful for the love we feel, not because we know what it's coming from, not because we know why we feel it, but because we don't know, because we don't understand. We don't understand it with our brains, with our logic. This is why it's love. Love is that field, that category that covers everything else that our brain has failed to, to grasp. It's a lesson for everyday life. It's not just bhakti. Well, it's the bhakti of everyday life, if you like. 
the world, everything in the world presents itself as mysterious, as, as a secret, as confidential. There's so many things in the world, just little things that we can see every day that we can only understand if we use the love code book, open the love code book and say, why is that child acting that way? Why is that man acting that way? Why is she happy? Why is he sad? Why is he angry? If we look at it through the love code, we can understand it. So many things, far more things than we can understand by apply, applying our logic to it. So if we took the challenge, if we really took the challenge of greeting life in terms of love, love given, love taken, love, love needed, love shared, too little, too much, too deep, too light. If we really took seriously the project of meeting life with love, it would change everything. It would change the entire uh, workings of the world. Rade, Rade, Budava Prabhu? Yes, yes, please. Uh, I would like uh, to ask you, you mentioned today, uh, you speak about opulence of God, internal opulence of God and external opulence of God. So, uh, is it more or less the category of Paidi Bhakti and Raga Bhakti? Uh, I'm going to t- really simplify and say yes, more or less. It's it's much more than that. It's much wider than Paidi Bhakti is, of course, the set of practicing the set of regulations, rules and regulations, religious practice as following the rules. This always keeps us external. So this is a this is the the external opulence is all you going to find with Vaid, through Vaidhi Bhakti, yes. But I think there are other ways of also just staying outside the opulence, not even doing any kind of Vaidhi Bhakti practice or any practice. But very simple terms, yes, you are absolutely right. It's definitely true that through Raghunuga Bhakti, we open the doors to the internal beauty of God. That is for sure. That is for sure. Thank you. Very good question. Thank you. Very, very beautiful. So we continue with Prabhupada, who says, While Krishna was present on this earth, he displayed all six opulences, the ones we just mentioned. Therefore, great sages like Parashara Muni have all accepted Krishna as the supreme personality of Godhead. The challenge is, once again, I don't want to spend so much time on this point, but these opulences uh, appeal to our ten- a tendency to look at uh, God externally, to admire these opulences from the outside. And what Krishna is inviting Arjuna to do is to develop a devotional relationship to him so that he can deepen his understanding of God from the inside through seeing the mystery underneath. We continue with Prabhupada, who says, Now Krishna is instructing Arjuna in more confidential knowledge of his opulences and his work. So he's trying to give Arjuna deeper knowledge. We From chapter 9, we had... The introduction to the idea of the confidential knowledge, which is the, the love code, the love code book for God. And now, since Arjuna's devotion is growing, since his love for God is growing, he's able to go deeper, just exactly the way Gurudev tells us to dive deeper. The more devotion we have, the deeper we can go without oxygen, the deeper we can go into the, into the mystery of the depths. The more we and the more that is revealed to us when we when we go deeper. So the more we have intimate knowledge of God, the more we are able to find even more intimate knowledge of God and of ourselves. Let's remember that. That by discovering who God is, we discover who we are because we are part and parcel of God. In short, it means that we cannot receive intimate knowledge of the divine or about life externally. We can't sit back like we're in a cinema and watching the film, just sit there and be passive. All we'll get are passing appearances. And what all we'll get is the external beauty, the external opulence. And it's exactly the kind of opulence that fades with time. Like our beautiful bodies, like a beautiful picture, like a beautiful, let's say, a building, which all fades away with time. So opulence in this chapter means internal opulence. 
intimate knowledge of God, which means, again, intimate knowledge of ourselves. Then Prabhupada goes on. He says, previously, beginning with seventh chapter, the Lord had already explained his different energies and how they're acting. So we haven't read chapter seven yet. Maybe you know it. It's a chapter which is all about the energies, as he's saying, mat- internal, external, material, immaterial uh, energies and the way they work. And we can, when we go, when we get that far, which will be in 2024, I'm starting to think, when we get that far, we'll see that Radharani is very present with her, with her, um, prema shakti, her loving energy. So in that chapter seven, we also have these loving energies, the devotional energies. Prabhupada says, now in this chapter, uh, he, that is Krishna, explains his specific opulences to Arjuna. So he's taking, he's leading Arjuna into the depths, helping him to discover more and more deeply the inner beauty of God. And I repeat, the inner beauty of all Jivas. All the different characteristics are given in this chapter different clues as to the nature of God and to the nature of the jiva and the nature of the individual souls. So it's very important, and he reminds us throughout the chapter that we must distinguish carefully between external opulence and internal meaning. And as we know in our everyday lives, this is very challenging. We see something externally beautiful and we think that it's the end of the world for us. It's everything we want. Um, whether it be a nice big piece of chocolate or a, a beautiful man or a beautiful woman. And we think that from the external appearances, it has everything internally that we need. And of course, we're very often surprised to learn that this is not the case. So opulence is often a covering, often a material covering, and often something which is offered to our material senses and often very strongly, often very very deeply appealing to our external material senses. And, and whenever that happens, we're invited to forget our spiritual senses, our, our spiritual bodies. Instead of being patient and looking for the indirect understanding, we go for the direct understanding. But Krishna is often hiding there. This is what the chapter is showing us. He's often hiding beneath the surface. He's a bit naughty that way, actually. We, we know that Krishna is a famously naughty boy. And this is one way that he's, he's naughty, that he presents us with externally opulent material things, which make us think that this is what life is about and hides from us for long term, for short term, the internal richness of our spiritual lives. <laughs> Prabhupada says in the previous chapter, Krishna explained his different energies to establish devotion and firm conviction. It was really the introduction to bhakti, which is why Gurudev instructed us to read it first. It was an introduction to the um, energies of the heart of devotion, um, prema shakti, pleasure potency, Radharani's energies. That's what we were studying in, in chapter 9. Prabhupada continues, again in this chapter, Krishna tells Arjuna about his manifestations and his various opulences. The more one hears about the Supreme God, the more one becomes fixed in devotional service. So the the deepening knowledge of the internal appearance of God inspires devotees to increase their devotion, increase their love. And the more one is devoted, the deeper one can go. And this is why he reserves, Krishna reserves this experience for his dear friend Arjuna. We started the chapter, the verse by, by understanding that Arjuna was a very dear friend to Krishna. And that's why he's invited in. So our objective as devotees is also to become dear friends of Krishna so that we may be invited in to the internal life of opulence that's waiting for us deeper and deeper. The more deeper we go, the more we are able to go. Then Prabhupada continues, one should always hear about the Lord in the association of devotees. That will enhance one's devotional service. 
So it's not enough to hear about the Lord. That's very good. But it's essential to hear it with others. Why is that? This is so we can share the love with others. It's not just a question of loving God, having a loving relationship with God, but having a loving relationship with each other, which redoubles our love for God, but also is a, is a way of experience God, experiencing God in the others. When we're together with other devotees, we share our love with each other and we reinforce the love that we have for each other. We reinforce the love we have for the divine in the other. Everyone has a part and parcel of, of Radharani in herself, in himself. And the more we are together in association, in discussing, in talking, in singing, in chanting, in praying, the more this deepens. Everything we do together, and not only devotees, everything we do together with a pure heart, we know this from experience, deepens our understanding of divine love and deepens our understanding, therefore, of, of God. So it's a shared understanding. Yes, it's very helpful. We can discuss and understand things much better and like we're trying to do in this, in this sharing here. But it's also a practice, practicing of loving. It's a, it's applying what we've learned about Radha Mohan with fellow devotees, with fellow, fellow jivas, all jivas. We can do this. Maybe we prefer our devotee uh, brothers and sisters, but also we should do it with our husbands and wives, with our children, with our colleagues, with our friends, and with strangers. We're all de always developing our love. There's no love lost. Uh, sounds like Shakespeare, doesn't it? There's no love lost in loving a stranger in giving a gentle pat on the back to a stranger. We're getting closer to divine love every time we, we do that. There's no love lost. Every love we give contributes to advancing us towards purifying the love in our hearts and coming closer to God the Mohan. So we should be as loving as we can be, essentially. Um, uh, Prabhupada then goes on. Discourses in the society of devotees can take place only among those who are really anxious to be in Krishna consciousness. Others cannot take part in such discourses. So this is discourses uh, talking talking about love. I, see, I don't think he's contradicting what I just said about loving people who are also not devotees. I, I, I don't agree that he's uh, contradicting me. I think he's talking about sharing the ideas, sharing the 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 words of the of the of the sacred texts and the Bhagavad Gita and others. Yeah. But we do need to have open ears. In order to share ideas like we're doing here, we need to have open ears. And our ears are not opened by logic, they're opened by tenderness. <laughs> they're opened by sharing. They're opened by, by devotion and, and love. <coughs> our ears, our ears are spiritual. Our ears are not mechanical. They look kind of silly and clumsy, and they don't always work very well, but they're spiritual tools, these ears. They look material, but they're spiritual tools. Why? Because they can take in the loving mood of the message from uh, others. It's kind of a song of love. Bhagavad Gita is a song. Gita means song, of course. The song of Bhagavatam. So we need to have our spiritual ears open. And we almost need to conduct a spiritual orchestra. And hear all the different instruments of the spiritual orchestra. Playing into our ears the different facets of love playing, the piccolos and the violins and the trumpets and the oboes, they're all different moods and spirits of the, of the symphonic loving sound that's coming through the air into our ears. So this is really the secret of sharing, of, of Harikata. It's that we're, yes, the content is important, the discourse is important, we need to understand, but we are sharing much, much more than content. This is why association is so important. We're communicating, we're sharing love and devotion. I would even go as far as to say the content matters less than the, than the experience of, of the sharing. I'm not sure that others or Gurudev would agree with me, but I'll risk that statement. So some, I told the story once in a Zoom, but, but I wanted to just tell you again that sometimes I'm sitting in my office in Paris 
you know, all by myself, feeling a little bit isolated. And um, and in the bigger Zooms, particularly the, um, the Japanese Zoom, then the translations are going on and we're talking and we're reading. And sometimes nobody knows, but I sneak and I put on the, I click on the Japanese translation to listen to the translation of the Japanese. And of course, I don't understand a word, not one word. I couldn't say hello in Japanese, <laughs> but I hear, I feel it. I feel the, 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 the form. I feel the emotion. I feel the devotion coming through our beautiful, uh, our wonderful team of Japanese translators. There are a few of them here, like Kishori and Namani. It's, uh, and it's just wonderful. I don't understand a thing with my brain, but I understand everything in my body, in my heart. Uh, and then I quickly k- click over before someone asks me a question about what I just heard. <laughs> so finally, then the last little comment of Prabhupada in this verse is, the Lord clearly tells Arjuna that because he is very dear, for his benefit, such discourses are taking place. Krishna loves Arjuna, and so he's sharing with him. This is the message. It's because of the love and through the love that the sharing is happening. Discourse, that's Prabhupada's word, written in English. It's not a translation. Discourse means two ways. Sharing, exchange. Uh, maybe we could start to make it close to the, uh, the, the word anurag, which uh, Gurudev often explains to us. It's not quite that. But what is important about discourse is that there are two sides. There cannot be one side. There must be a sharing. You give, I receive, I give, you receive. So the emotion is somehow shared, not just words. The waves of sound, the music of the voices, the tone, the volume, the expression. <sighs> now let's go on to chapter, unless there's a comment or input or other sharing. Chapter, sorry, chapter 10, verse 2. Nami vidu sura gana. Ah, thank you. Nami vidu sura gana. Prabhavam namarasha sayaha. Aham adir hi devanam. Mahar shinam cha sara shaha. Neither the hosts of demigods nor the great sages know my origin. For In every respect, I am the source of the demigods and the sages. Neither the hosts, host means all those, so many, many, many demigods. Neither the hosts of the demigods nor the great sages know my origin. This is, this, this verse is really all about explaining where all this comes from, the reason for it, the cause of it, the origin of it. Um, and the main point of the verse is that We cannot know the origin of ourselves because it came before us. We cannot know it immediately and directly. Someone can tell us about it. We can hear a story about it, a myth about it. But we cannot know our origins. We mortals and the demigods who are half mortals. It's the one thing that is invisible to us. The one thing on which, for which we must depend on God to tell us or myths, or legends, or other stories. We cannot be present at our own birth. That's the one thing, one event we cannot go to, no matter how how much the ticket costs, how much we can pay for the ticket. We cannot go to our that event. So we cannot know what happened. We cannot know what we're made of. We can only feel what's come after, the manifestations, the incorporations, the, the what do you say, the in incarnations. Um, Prabhupada comments then. As stated in the Brahma Samhita, which we've read several times, Lord Krishna is the Supreme Lord. No one is greater than him. He is the cause of all causes. Here it is stated, also stated, says Prabhupada, here is also stated by the Lord personally that he is the cause of all the demigods and sages. And even the demigods and great sages cannot understand Krishna. They cannot understand neither his name nor his personality. So what is the position, asked Prabhupada, this is still Prabhupada, what is the position of the so-called scholars of this tiny planet? What do they think about this? 
What do the philosophers know about it? There are a couple of the words I want to underline for you here in this little part. The first is cause of all causes. What is a cause? What does it mean to be the cause? Is it cause and effect in the logical sense, or is it somehow inspiring cause? Is it immaterial cause? I cause you all to laugh because I tell a funny joke, or is it uh, a material cause? I cause your toe to hurt because I hit it with a hammer. Which kind of cause is it? That's what question will come to. And then the second important word in this text is personality. We've learned to be sensitive to this word. I think. Those demigods understand neither the name nor the personality. So personality means that we understand we have a loving devotional relationship to, to the cause of all things, like Arjuna has. We talk about Bhagavan, the personality of Godhead, as someone we have a personal relationship to. We have a loving or, or tender or, or emotional relationship to. In order to understand the cause, we need to have this personal relationship. It's not enough to be a philosopher to have a logical relationship to it. The cause of me breaking the glass is dropping it on the ground. It's not this kind of cause. It's what kind of energy in the world has caused the world to be what it is. And that energy is a loving energy. That energy is a, is a devotional energy. The, the, the demigods and the sages can't know this because they're philosophers, they're scholars, they're log logicians, they're interested in the logical cause of things. It's not knowledge. The cause of the universe is not knowledge like they're looking for. It's not the knowledge of which caused the glass to break on the ground. It's knowledge of the kind, what kind of energy motivated this person to fall in love with that person. What motivated that person to become a teacher for that person. What motivated that person to become a mother for these children or that a uh, person to become an architect and make beautiful buildings. It's that kind of internal, energic, energetic motivation we're talking about. And that energetic motivation has an origin, has a cause that we all know. It's loving energy of Radharani. At the heart of any immaterial cause, at the bottom of it, if we go back and back and back to the beginning of any immaterial cause, anyone, I promise you, it's love at the source. It's love at the source. And if it's love at the source, then it's our dear Radharani at the beginning of everything that's immaterial in the world. Any action that motivates human beings to do things, any origin that makes any human being undertake any project at all, it may be many things, maybe chain of many causes, but at the origin, it's love. Love is the basis of everything that happens in the hearts of human souls. So the divine truth about the world is not available to the demigods, it's not available to the sages, because it's not logical, it's prema. You can only understand it if you have a personal relationship to, to the thing you're trying to understand, namely the, the origin of the, of the universe, the cause of the universe. Sorry. So all the impersonal relations of the demigods and the sages won't help. We need to have the loving relation, which is a personal relation. Facts can be known, right? We know we know how many kilos uh, my this table weighs. We know how many how far I can throw a stone. We know what year the French Revolution happens. Facts we can know. This is easy. The sages and demigods know this. They know the facts. They know how tall I am. They know how wide the temple is. They know what time the sun goes down. But do they know personality? Do they know emotion? They don't. And what makes us what we are? How wide the temple is? How many stones I weigh? Of course not. That's not what I am. It's my personal being inside which knows. And this only devotees and devotionally oriented people can know. So in a way, and maybe this is a kind of surrender. We're protected by the fact that you, people who are not personally involved in us cannot know us. In my police record back in France, it says my 
my height, my weight, my address, my social security number, this and that, a hundred things, and the state thinks it knows me. But actually, the state doesn't threaten me at all and who I am because it doesn't know my personality. It doesn't know the loving interior part of me. So in one way, I'm protected. In another way, I'm in great danger, but let's not go with that one. <laughs> but in, in, the, in, the, in, in terms of the integ integrity of who I am in my soul, I'm protected by the fact that only a lover can know me and not a mathematician. Prabhupada continues now, no one can understand why this supreme God comes to earth as an ordinary human being and executes such commonplace and yet wonderful activities. So we cannot know this. This is Prabhupada. I don't know if I was uh, stealing from Prabhupada or Prabhupada stealing from me, but we're saying basically the same thing there. One should know then, Prabhupada says, that scholarship is not the qualification necessary to understand Krishna. Even the demigods and the great sages have tried to understand Krishna by their mental speculation, and they have failed to do so. So Krishna cannot be understood by mental speculation or philosophy or logic, only by feeling, only from the position of a devotee which again is why devotees are so, are so terribly, so wonderfully um, fortunate. Um, Prabhupada says, in Srimad Bhagavatam, it is also clearly said that, that even the great demigods are not able to understand the supreme personality of God. So Prabhupada gives more evidence from the Shastra. Um, uh, then he continues, they can speculate to the limits of their imperfect senses and reach the opposite conclusion of impersonalism. So people who don't see God and other jivas as personalities, as personal souls, they can reach the opposite conclusion of impersonalism, of something not manifested by the three qualities of material nature, the three gunas, or they can imagine something by mental speculation, but it's not possible to understand, understand Krishna by such foolish speculation. So demigods can do all they want in terms of speculation with their material senses to try to understand Krishna, but they're not going to get anywhere, says Prabhupada. They're not going to understand the origin. They're not going to understand the cause. They're limited uh, in their understanding by their material uh, nature. Um, we could say here, we could remember that we talked before about Brahma. Brahma is the reality, the ultimate reality, the absolute reality. It's, I think I described it before, as the sum of all the things that exist. And this can be understood through the rules of cause and effect. We can add up everything that is. If we were very, very smart, if we had a supercomputer, we could add up Brahma. We could envelop it and summarize it and make a model of it, if you like. That would be possible because it's finite. It's finite. But Bhagavan, the personality of Godhead, goes beyond. Personality of Godhead is everything that exists plus the love that exists, plus the energy of Radharani. So God is everything that is plus personality. And this is the part that cannot be explained. So the, the cause of Brahma maybe is explainable, but the cause of Bhagavan is not explainable. It's only through the spiritual senses we can perceive what the world is. Um, it's only by exercising our devotion, seeking to love, seeking love, seeking, desiring to love, wanting to love, wanting to serve Radharani in her, her um, loving relation with Mohan that we can understand the cause of the world. Prabhupada is now going on. Here the Lord indirectly says that if anyone wants to know the absolute truth, here I am present as the supreme personality, personality of Godhead, I am the supreme, one should know this. Although one cannot understand the inconceivable Lord who is personally present. So this personal dimension of God is not available to us according to Prabhupada. He exists, but he's not available to our understanding unless we're engaged 
in a devotional relationship with him. Prabhupada goes on, we can actually understand Krishna, who is eternal, full of bliss and knowledge, simply by studying his words in Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. Well, simply studying his words in the way that Prabhupada says we should study his words, by understanding these two texts as texts of bhakti. So both Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, or Prabhupada, are bhakti texts telling the story of devotional service. So we need, we need to read them carefully, according to Prabhupada, but we need to read them with our hearts. We need to read them as documents about devotional service. And essentially, that's what chapter 10 is doing here. It's, 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 it's telling Arjuna how to go deeper, how to go deeper through devotional service and understand the cause of the universe, the cause of God. And the more that love that connects Krishna and Arjuna, the further Arjuna can, can go in finding the spiritual knowledge, not the facts. And Prabhupada goes on, the impersonal Brahman can be conceived by persons who are already in the inferior energy of the Lord. But the personality of Godhead cannot be conceived unless one is in the transcendental position. So once again, he's making the same claim about Brahman as the ultimate reality can be understood by, by people in lower positions, but the higher position held by those who are doing devotional service, uh, those are the ones who can understand the personality of God. So impersonalists can look around anywhere and explain whatever you like, just from the surface. I am part of this universe. I can tell you why the door is open, why the windows are transparent, why everybody's sitting on a chair and not floating in the air. I can tell you all of this. But all is, of this is inert facts, logic, uh, physics, if you like. Everyone can grasp it just from the outside. But the personality of all these things, why these people are sitting here, why they're feeling what they're doing, why there's a fire in their heart, why they're sad, why they're longing, why they're, why they're overjoyed, all this can only be understood from a relationship with them. On the one hand, it's very simple. I can't understand a person unless I have a relationship with her. But on the other hand, we seem to forget this immediately. We, we relate to the external part of people. We don't seek to empathize. We don't seek to feel the love that they feel, to be with them in an empathetic way. It's remarkable. Everything we know about people comes from the inside, and yet we forget this. This is good news, really. Personality is the expression of everything that's good about us. Everything that's a little bit tedious is external. But the adventure is on the inside. The most tender parts of us, the most, the most uh, loving parts of us, these are all secretly under the surface and they require loving relation. So everything you want to know about God that's interesting, about guru, about husband, about wife, friends and children, this happens by entering into a relationship with them, not by staying at the outside. Entering, entering in a relationship with them, knowing them internally, identifying with their hearts, seeing them as loving beings, seeing ourselves as loving beings, becoming spiritual friends with them. That's what we do. That's what we want to do as bhakta. Become spiritual friends with everyone. Mm-hmm. Developing spiritual trust. This is what will protect us, our hearts, and will let us become closer to God. That's what also that's what keeps God close to us in our in our hearts, this confidentiality. So we can't know what the personality of God is unless we're inside, unless we're driven by a love, unless we're driven by the love for love. I want to love your love. I want to know your love. I know I want to know your loving. This is what Radha, Radha, Radhika says every day to Mohan. I want to love your love. I want to see us in love. I want to do it again. Go back to the Kunj. Relive this love. That's what I need to tell my annoying work, work colleague every day. I want to see the love in your heart. Where is it? Let's find it. It's there. Of course it's there. To identify the loving energy of Radharani in every person we have to do with, this is doing the work of Radhika when she's preparing for her midnight feast with Mohan. It's the same work, much more modest level, 
It's the same exercise. Enhancing the love, making the love live, liberating the love. This is the work we do as, as, as bhakta. This is the work we do as devotees. And we do it on the model of Radharani. This is Manjari Bhav. Prabhupada continues. Because most men and women, let's say, cannot understand Krishna in his uh, actual situation, out of his causeless mercy, he descends to show favor to such speculators in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, to show loving relations to the world and to experience them himself, he incarnates as Mahaprabhu. This is Prabhupada, of course, saying what's obvious to all of us who are following bhakti, that the reason he comes in this form is to show favor to spectators of those who are interested in knowing what loving relation is. So yes, it's a double, well, there are three reasons, but the main reason is for Krishna to experience what it's like to love and to be loved, not just to be the opulent, powerful, beautiful Krishna who's loved by all, of course, what he always was anyway, but to actually be inside this love and feel the love and feel the passion feel the, the bitterness, feel the longing, and feel the fulfillment of love, and to show us how to do it. This is why we read the Leelas, to understand and to explore all the nooks and crannies and corners of the ability of a human soul to love. That's what we're reading every day in Milapakus Manjari Naradarasa Sudaniti. It's all the little angles of love that we are capable of in our hearts, because we are a reflection of the hearts of Radha and Mohan when they're living out this, these adventures every night in the Kunj. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada says, Yet despite the Supreme Lord's uncommon activities, these speculators, due to contamination in the material energy, still think that the impersonal Brahman is the Supreme. They still think that the totality of reality is all there is, that there's no love which is energizing it. And it's because, says Prabhupada, they are impure. Their hearts are impure. That they're covered, they have material coverings, just like ours in our in our covered in our in our primitive phases of, of bhakti. Our hearts are covered. We're not seeing the world as a place of love. And it's our task through our practice to clean off our hearts, to dust it off, to scrape it off, to purify it of all the inputs that distract us from love and from seeing the love in others. And once we see the love in others, then we see the world as a place of love. And we understand that God is a personality and not just um, a mechanical um, inert Brahman. This is again the revelation of Mahaprabhu. They cannot know Mahaprabhu because their hearts are not open to see that there's God is a loving relation. Mm -hmm. You can't see this through material senses. You have to see it through the spiritual senses, through the, through the heart. So this is why Prabhu, Prabhupada goes on and says, only the devotees who are fully surrendered unto the Supreme Lord can understand this by the grace of the su Supreme Personality, that He is Krishna. So surrender, let's understand by that, opening our hearts. And when we open our hearts, the first thing we see is the hearts of others. Because hearts communicate with hearts. Lovers communicate with lovers. Lovers don't communicate with robots. Lovers don't communicate with stones. Hearts communicate with hearts. When ha our hearts are uncovered and free, we see the hearts of the others and we help them to uncover their hearts too, to clean away the material coverings on their heart. This is what surrendering is, or one way of understanding surrendering. It's giving in to the idea that we are not the body, we are not mechanical, we are not material, we are hearts, we are lovers. And then it's a chain reaction, like a nuclear explosion. My heart liberates your heart, your heart liberates his heart, her heart. And Guru Dev multiplies the effect, and then it grows bigger and bigger, and suddenly we have hearts liberating hearts, liberating hearts. This is our, this is our 
ambition as bhakta. This is the full release of the energy of Radharani. When hearts lead to other hearts being liberated, then Radharani is smiling. Then she's liberating the heart of Mohan, and she will have been a, bed, a good guru to us. Then Prabhupada says, and we're going to finish now, soon I think for today, a little bit early today for special reasons. <laughs> Prabhupada says, the devotees of the Lord don't bother about impersonal Brahman about the impersonal Brahman conception of God. Their faith and devotion bring them to surrender immediately unto the Supreme Lord, the devotees. And out of causeless mercy for Krishna, they can understand Krishna. The devotees can see Krishna and understand him because they see him through spiritual eyes. Let's remember what mercy is. Mercy means causeless goodness. Remember, the whole chapter is about what is the cause of the universe. And the answer is, for bhakti, there is no cause. It's mercy. It's goodness which we receive without having to pay for it, without earning it, without deserving it. It's a gift which has no uh, give back. There's nothing giving back. The, the cause of the universe is mercy itself. In other words, there is no cause. It's just God's love, which gives and which we give, and we get it back. We give and give, and God gives, and love goes round and round in an endless cycle of, of giving. And this, and with Radharani's energy driving the entire process. So we surrender immediately unto the Supreme Lord, and out of the causeless mercy of Krishna, we can understand Krishna. Only by understanding that there's no cause. Or that love has the, is the cause and love has no cause. Love just is. You don't earn love. You have it. That's the beauty of it. That's what mercy is. You don't have to earn anything. You, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to pay for it. You just have to receive it. Open yourself and receive it. And then, of course, keep it. Finally, no one else can understand him, says Prabhupada. So even great sages agree. What is Atma? What is the soul identity? What is the self, soul self? What is the supreme? It is he whom we have to worship. It just is. We venerate, we recognize, and that's what our spiritual self is. It's he who is. It's that which is. Tatva. In Sanskrit. It's that which is. That's all there is. That's the only explanation. It's the love which is which organizes the world, which energizes the world, and which, through which we uh, live and which flows through us. So we surrender, and we're just letting it happen. We're letting love. That's what surrender means, and that's what our practice needs to be. Uh, and there we stop. Rati, rati, go in the, go in the.